Great bass playing can take your mix to a whole nother level. Not a half nother, a whole nother. So what makes great bass playing and what role does it play in the mix? And then how do we get there with concrete steps for our bass players? Today, we're gonna dive into what makes great bass playing so that you can take your tone and your timing up a notch and make everybody feel much better in the mix. Hey, if you're new here, my name's James and I help worship leaders, sound techs, and worship team members play and sing their best by taking the mystery and frustration out of your sound equipment. If that's you, go ahead and mash that subscribe button. The bass guitar provides a critical link between the drums, which are mainly a rhythmic instrument, and the rest of the mid-range instruments. And it creates sort of a bedrock or a foundation for everything else that we have in the mix. So, if the kick drum provides the punch of our low end, the bass guitar provides the sustain of the low end. And there are a few key factors it has to have in order to bridge that gap really well. Without a strong bass element in the mix, a loud mix feels louder. So actually adding in the bass makes things feel less harsh, even though you've turned up more level in the low frequencies. But it's not just enough to have a bass player. And if that's where you're at, that's a good starting place. I would much rather have a bass player than just have the keyboard player's left hand. There are things the bass can do to really lock everything together in your mix. And speaking of locking in, the first thing that makes great bass playing is great timing. When I was first starting to learn to play bass, right, I had been playing guitar for a while and I wanted to join the worship team. And they said, well, we've got plenty of guitar players. How about you play bass? And I started by learning finger picking, so I already knew the notes on the neck. So it wasn't a big leap for me to start playing bass, but I was really timid at first and I didn't want to hit the wrong note. So I would come in just a little bit after everybody just to make sure that the chord that was on the chart is the chord where we're actually going in the song. And that wasn't the greatest, right? Having no confidence in what the note was meant that I was playing just a little bit late and that lateness didn't help fill things up the way that it could. So it's critical to get right on the downbeat and to play right with the kick drum when you need to, to really establish the chord is starting here and now. Now, the thing about bass playing is that it's kind of boring, right? You're playing one note at a time, most of the time. And a lot of times the parts can be so simple that it can make you want to yawn. And that's happened to me too. I've actually been yawning on stage and it was really embarrassing for me. I didn't like it. I don't think anybody else liked it. So it can be tricky to play bass. So getting your timing right, no, it's not exciting. No, it's not flashy, like getting a new guitar pedal with tons of delay and cool chorus or learning a fancy new lick and playing pentatonic scales over stuff. It's not as much flash, but when you get it really right, it makes a huge difference for the rest of the team. So here are three steps for getting great timing. The first one is to actually warm up your picking hand before you start playing. I picked this up from Michael League, the bass player and arranger for Snarky Puppy, and he warms up just playing open strings to a metronome. And that's it. He's just trying to get this finger acting at just the right time. And if you can work that out before you start playing, before rehearsal or before sound check, then you'll be more warmed up and tighter when it comes to actually play the worship set. We wanna work out all the cobwebs and the lack of responsiveness in our hand before we start playing. A lot of times we think about warm-ups and we think about how many notes we can play over here, but really, playing worship, we're not playing a whole lot of notes over here most of the time, unless you're playing gospel, but that's different, right? So most of the CCM music, yeah, that's just, you know, a lot of this and a little bit of this. Now, before you tell me that that's boring, vocalists tough to warm up too, but when you warm up on the bass, not everybody has to hear it, but when the vocalists do sirens or sing, mommy made me mash my M&Ms over and over and over again, everybody has to hear that. So at least you get to warm up quietly. Now, the next thing to improve your timing is to practice to a metronome or a drum beat. Now, if you cannot stand a metronome, there are apps out there that will have a beat that you can play along to. And this is super helpful for really getting into the groove and making sure that you're nailing the timing there. There are two things that we're aiming for. We're aiming for accuracy in hitting the note at just the right time so that we're really locked in. And we're also aiming for developing our internal sense of time so that if the click goes away or if you're doing something spontaneous and there's no click and it's just the pad and the bass and you're trying to keep the tempo with the vocalists, 
you're not either rushing or dragging because you don't have an internal clock on what the metronome or what the tempo should be. So the first thing that you need to practice with your timing is just playing in time with the metronome. So I've got my metronome here and I've actually set it to 30 beats per minute and I've set it on the 16th. So that means that I'm gonna get the same thing as a quarter note at 120 or an eighth note at 60 BPM, whatever you wanna do it there. But we're just gonna practice right along with the click and practice getting our fingers going exactly at the right time. Now it also helps if you record this and listen back to yourself and it's terrifying, but it'll help you get better. So let's give it a shot. So even on upwind strings, we're trying to make them all even and all really consistent. So now what we can do is play that same pattern, but I'm gonna cut the beats in half. So I'm gonna switch this to eighth notes, but I'm gonna still play the same pattern. I'm cutting in half the number of subdivisions that are there so that I have to become the subdivision. It's boring, but the masters have mastered all the boring stuff. So when you've mastered all the boring stuff, then you can do the fun stuff. And that's the hump that a lot of bass players never get over. Now, if we really wanna stretch ourselves, we cut those beats in half again. And that makes us really have to internalize the beat. because There's less supporting us there. This is helpful for when it drops down to just a pad and it's, we're supposed to be playing still, but maybe we have the tendency to rush or to drag a little bit. This is gonna help fill in that gap so that we are solid on our own, even when the click isn't there. Yeah, that was terrifying, and I have a lot more to practice. Now you can also play along to a click with your songs and then recording yourself playing those parts, then you can diagnose what you hit and what you missed. Again, this is terrifying, but it's what makes progress. Now, when it comes to tone, there are three things that I'm looking for in a great bass player. The first one is consistency. If their tone is a little bit off or there's some things that I don't love about it, but at least they're sending me the same kind of tone most of the time, I can fix that at the soundboard and not have to chase things around with the EQ or compression. If it's inconsistent and all over the place and the low end levels change from section to section or moment to moment, that's harder. That's an extra thing that I, as the sound tech, have to worry about. So for bass players, making sure that you give consistent tone is really helpful. Now when we're thinking about our bass tone, it actually starts in our fingers, right? So my fingernails are actually a little bit long right now. So I'll get a nice round tone for most of my plucks, then every once in a while there'll be a dow in there. So it's like, you know, nice and round, and then it'll catch a little bit. 
and that's not so pleasant. So I like to trim my fingernails when I'm playing bass so that I don't get that accidental catch and it just gets more consistent. Now, you might like that. It might be a nice bridge between a pick and finger style. That's up to you, but at least make it consistent. So let me trim my nails real quick. A few moments later. So that's feeling better. You've made another step toward consistent tone. Now, the other place where you need to watch consistency is the placement of your hand along where you're picking. Toward the bridge is gonna be brighter. Toward the neck is gonna be a little darker. Same thing goes for your pickups, but I'm just using a P bass, so I've only got one pickup. Uh, your pickup selector is a part of that, but where you pluck actually does matter. And the consistency that you have and where you pluck matters a lot too. So as a sound tech, I'm looking for consistency so that I can get that mix rock solid. If the low end is changing between you playing over here and playing over here, that's gonna affect the way that that relationship with the kick drum and how much I can push those subs, it's gonna vary a whole lot. So you have to be careful or at least intentional about where you are plucking and do it in the same place for the same kind of tones that you're after. So let me just demonstrate on one note how plucking feels different and the tone changes and remember to wear your headphones for this part. So personally, I kind of like to rest my thumb right here on the pickup, but wherever you do rest your thumb, wherever you anchor yourself, or if you just play in the same spot, it doesn't have to be anchored on anything, just play more consistently, that's gonna help the sound tech get great tone, and there's gonna be tonal changes that you have to make. Another thing that a lot of beginning bass players don't touch ever is the tone knob. So the tone knob is basically a low pass filter that can take off the bite or any of the fret clang that comes with playing bass. So uh, uh, if we turn that tone knob all the way down, we're still hitting it hard. I can still hear it acoustically from the bass, but that fret noise goes away a little bit. That's not always what you want. You need some of that bite in the bass guitar sometimes. So we don't always wanna turn it down just to get rid of that, but that's one extra flavor that you can use. Now, if you're playing low, those notes tend to sound good, having a little bit extra brightness and top end to give your ear that idea of, hey, there's a note here. When you start playing up high, sometimes that darker tone can feel cool. Especially if you're in a verse two or a down bridge and you still wanna add something without being totally out, rolling off that tone knob can help you add something that really fits in that moment. The next step is to send a balanced tone. So we're trying to balance the attack of the note, so in kind of the initial click or the higher frequencies that come along with the bass note. So we're trying to balance that with the fundamental frequency or the root note of what we're playing. And that's what kind of rumbles people's chests and we like that feeling. And then we're also trying to balance the tone or the overtones of those root notes. Sometimes in a quieter setting, those overtones from the bass guitar can help fill in in our brain and give us an idea that it's actually bigger than it is on the low end because we hear the overtones of those notes. So just because it isn't a bass frequency doesn't mean that it's not important for the bass. Now in-ear monitors can make this really challenging because we've got little tiny drivers really close to our ear canals. So every little clang on the bass and every little fret noise can be really jarring for us. So what happens to a lot of bass players is they will turn down all the top end on their tone because they hear so much of it. Then the sound tech has nothing to work with on the top end and to get the bass to really cut through in addition to just rumbling, they've got to do a lot of work to get that up there. The other problem that you can run into with in-ear monitors is that if the seal isn't there on your tips, you will hear no low end and you will want to crank the bass up until it's distorting and you'll still ask for more because you can't feel it. The problem is not with the in-ear monitor system, it's with the seal on your ear canals. Because these wavelengths are so long, you have to have a sealed cavity in your ear canal in order for your in-ear monitors to reproduce them in a way that your eardrum can pick it up. Now, when it comes to mid and upper frequencies, you can go too far. 
right? So like, if you take a look at Sting and the Police, his bass tone is really 400 and 500 heavy, and that's bitey and kind of growly, and that can be cool, but it doesn't always fit with you know, like piano ballads on your worship team. Now, if you're playing gospel and slap as part of your repertoire, then yes, you do need those upper frequencies above 1K, and you really need to get that to slap and cut through. That can be really important, but you don't wanna hurt anybody with it, so please still be careful with those frequencies. Now, the flip side of this is that some people will take their active bass EQ and boost up the lows all the way, and that can be cool, but again, if you have too much lows, then you're not gonna have as much mids and highs. So again, it's a balancing act. We can turn up all the frequencies with the fader. I call it a broadband EQ. And that can get stuff in the ballpark. Then we can use our EQ to balance the different sections in relation to one another. But do that with the bass at the right level already. So beyond the bass itself and where we're plucking, we can add pedals. And these are two of them that I have. I've got some other ones that I'm working on. But these are two that can do some good stuff for your bass. So the first one is a, the Boss Graphic Equalizer pedal. And when if I have it off, and I listen to my tone, I've got it all the way open on the tone knob. It's a little more bitey in the mid-range than I really want. So two frequencies that I sometimes like to duck on the bass if it's got a little bit more of that bitey feeling is around 800 and 400. And I like a little bit of boost around 200 because it makes the bass feel a little bit warmer and rounder. And these changes that I'm making are very slight, so there's not a whole lot of gain difference on these different bands. But listen as I engage the EQ pedal, how it kind of rounds out a little bit and gets rid of a little bit more of that bite. So that fits for me, and it's what I like with the combination of this bass and these pickups. I just want to EQ them a little bit before it gets sent to the soundboard. You can leave it alone and just let the sound tech deal with it at the soundboard, but the less decisions that the sound tech has to make for adjusting your tone, the easier time they're going to have getting that really locked in with the kick drum, right? So they're not fighting your tone if you're sending them a better tone. We'll talk about more pedals in just a minute, but first let's talk about dynamics. Now, when we're first starting to play bass, we wonder when should we come in and when should we not come in? And if you're not even thinking that, you just start playing the whole song from downbeat to outro, right? We wanna avoid that because we want to have the music come up and down with the bandwidth or the frequency range that the bass can add on the bottom end is there sometimes and it's not there other times. That's a good thing. And when we're taking that first step toward having some dynamics, a good rule of thumb is to play when the drums are playing and not play when the drums aren't playing. And that's kind of binary, right? The bass is either on or off. But we can take our bass playing to another level by adding some dynamics, both in the notes that we play and the register that we play on the neck and in the tones that we're using and even some distortion. Now, before you start crucifying me for saying distortion, and if you think that the people are gonna come out of the pews and come over onto the stage and knock over the bass player because he put a distortion pedal on his bass in church, hold on and take a deep breath. I'm gonna explain and I'm gonna show you a really great bass player that had a very much more distorted bass tone than I would have recognized, and it sounds awesome. So if your worship team plays some songs that are more in the rock genre, you can add a distortion or overdrive pedal for your bass. Now there are bass preamps that can have some drive built in, and this drive does a couple different things. The drive can add some pleasant overtones, like some tube distortion that's gentle, and it kind of rounds out the bass tone at a low level, or a low level of distortion. Taking that up a notch, we can go into the overdrive or distortion category, where we're actually producing a whole lot of distorted mid-range with the bass. So before you say that I'm crazy, I have a couple examples that you can check out. The first thing you can do is go to multitracks.com and you can preview some of their tracks on there. You can find some that have really distorted bass on them. I'll put some links to those down in the description below. You wouldn't think that overdrive and distortion on bass would fit, but it adds an extra layer of distortion into the guitar range 
and beefs it up in another way that just another distorted electric guitar doesn't quite do. The other example I'll show you is from Cassie Campbell. She's currently on tour with Brooke Lidgertwood, and she's an awesome, awesome bass player. Listen to some of her bass tones from this event that we did a few years ago. So here's a little section that shows just how distorted bass tone can get. It's a section where it's going from a quiet section to a loud section. So I'll play it and let you hear some of her little swells and fills and stuff. And then when she comes in, it's pretty uh, rocking and distorted. I'll play it for a little bit in the context of the rough mix. Don't judge me on the mix. This is just raw tracks. And then I'll solo it so you can hear just how much distortion is there. If that doesn't give you a stank face, something's broken. You can see there's quite a bit of distortion there. I'll play a little bit earlier where it's less distorted so you can kind of hear that, you know, she does have clean tone moments as well. So it's another way we can add dynamics with clean tone and distorted stuff. All right, so that's a little light drive. A little bit earlier, you can hear it. Lots of variety and distortion is a good thing on the bass. Now you might have tried a distortion pedal on your bass before and been underwhelmed because as most distortion pedals do, they actually have a high pass filter inside of them to keep it from sounding too woofy. So the distortion part can be a little bit thinner and then you lose all the low end from the bass and, and what's the fun in that, right? So what you're looking for in a bass overdrive pedal is to have at least a clean path that preserves the low end unfiltered in all of its glory so that all those subs can do their job and rock people to their core. Dedicated bass pedals will do this, but there's a couple more that'll do it. Stuff that's modeled on the Klon Centaur will do it. And then there's pedals like the JHS Moonshine, which has a clean blend in with the signal so that you can get all the distortion in the mid-range, have it not too woofy with the distortion, and then blend in the clean tone so that you get all those low frequencies and all their glory. I've got some links to ones that I like down in the description below, but if you have some that you love, drop them down in the comments. I'd love to hear what you're using on your bass for overdrive or distortion. Oh, and pro tip, make sure that with any pedal that you add, that it doesn't change the overall level when you stomp on it. Now the distortion pedal can add a little bit of perceived level because we're going more into the mid range, but we don't want it the low end to actually jump up much or any at all. So be careful to set the gain structure on your pedals so that on or off, your level's about the same. Your sound tech will thank you. So this next one is optional and not every bass player has one of these on their pedal board, but I really like a compressor because I like to feel the extra sustain that it gives me. This particular one is the Mary Cries compressor from PRS and it's emulating a Teletronics LA-2A. It's an optical compressor, it's very slow, it's got a very musical attack and release and it preserves all the low end. So some compressor pedals have such a fast attack time that it kind of chokes off the low end and can't describe all of that right now, but this one feels great and the bass still feels big even when it's compressed a lot. So let me push that on and you can hear the difference. There might be a slight level change that I'll try to adjust in post if it's not awesome. Because again, if you haven't heard me say this before, an extra boost in level will change your perception of and make it sound better. So if something gets louder, we automatically think it's better. It might just be louder, right? So uh, we'll try to match those levels as we turn it on and off. All right, that's a little bit much. So let's dial it back a little bit. So the extra sustain that I get out of the pedal 
is really, really nice. It just lets me do more things of holding longer notes. Makes me feel like I don't have to play as busy in gentler sections. And that bass can kind of become like a pad. It's holding on for longer and doesn't have to flutter up the mix with extra notes being hit. It just, the sustain is awesome. One more thing I almost forgot to tell you is that when you start adding gain devices like a compressor or an overdrive pedal, the muting of the strings or the ringing out of the strings becomes more and more apparent. So you're gonna have to get used to really muting with your thumb over here on the lower strings or your fingers over here on the higher strings so that as you are playing these notes, you're not having other stuff ringing out open while you're playing something else and it makes a cluttery mess. So it might seem like a little deal. It might not feel like in the moment that it's making a big difference, but trust me, those extra ringing strings do make a big difference. So in addition to practicing your timing and getting your tone consistent, make sure that you're using good technique to make sure that those strings are muted all the time. So that's a big overview of how you can take your bass playing up a notch. Whether you're learning new parts or just playing simply, those are some things that you can do to become a better bass player and have more fun playing the bass. And hopefully you get less bored too. If you wanna set up a system for checking your sounds and your tones and hearing how the audience actually hears it, you can sign up for my virtual sound check challenge. It walks you through how to set up your console to record all the band's inputs and then play it back. So without the band on stage, you can go out in the audience and hear what it actually sounds like for everybody else. You can hear your own tone, you can hear your own timing, and you can get practice dialing in the mix too if you're a sound tag. You can sign up through the link down in the description below and it will really revolutionize the way that your church worship team operates. Between setting up your in-ear monitors and getting things dialed in and actually hearing your blunders and mistakes in a safe place, of course. It's really gonna help you take your entire team up another level. If this video was helpful for you, go ahead and share it with a worship leader or bass player friend. And if you've got some more tips, type them down in the comments below. I love to read all of your comments. Kindly remember to mash that subscribe button. And remember, it's all about the low end, avoid the sound tech solo, and nobody leaves church humming the kick drum. Though they might hum the bass line if you're really good. Check out some more videos on mixing bass and mixing your monitors over here, and we'll see you back here next time on Attaway Audio.